So the founder of The Real News, his name is uh, Paul Jay, and he is a journalist from Toronto. And I actually started noticing that a lot of the sources for The Real News are from Canada, as well as other parts of, um, you know, the world besides the United States, if you want to put it that way. Uh, Naomi Klein is another person who's been sourced for it. Um, and what they're <coughs> what they've been doing lately is they're trying to break through as the real alternative left uh, news source. The problem is that it doesn't matter what part of the spectrum you're from. You can choose whatever stories you want to talk about. If you want to emphasize things that are convenient for your world view, viewpoint, I'm fine with that. <coughs> if you want to not talk about things that are not convenient for your world viewpoint, um, you know, it's your choice. You can still get shit talked about it. But there's at the end of the day, every single outlet, and every whether it's a corporation or a nonprofit news organization, uh, they have discretion to put whatever they want in their news feed, and um, that's fine. What's not right is when they outright lie and give disinformation about a situation on the ground, and that's something that I've been noticing that the the real news <laughs> is talking is is actually doing. Uh, in a number of topics, and the, the most explicit one is Venezuela. So let's go over, watch some of that footage from Venezuela that they're doing. It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. If you review the headlines these days, the news out of Venezuela looks like it could not get any worse. In just the past few days alone, not to mention the last few months, headlines in U.S. and international media outlets have been like this. Venezuela's desperation grows as the nation struggles for food, says Kansas City Star. Violence over food in Venezuela continues, running out of food, medicine, and patience in Venezuela, says NPR. Venezuela is on the brink, and the Maduro approach is not working, says CNBC. Venezuela now faces imminent famine, says Forbes magazine. Venezuela's deepening food crisis sees ransacked doors, deadly riots, says CBC. Looting and unrest continue roiling Venezuela as shortages persist, says the LA Times. However, a recent article in the Nation magazine titled how severe is Venezuela's crisis? Print picture of what is happening. So let's talk about what source she just used. Sorry for the skip. Uh, the Nation is the same publication that is, uh, I think it's edited by Chris Hayes, that uh, idiot who is on MSNBC. So, you know, The Nation is a far left progressive. Uh, well, not quite as far left as the real news, but um, all they all they do is spout off about. Um, it says here it covers architecture, art, corporations, defense, environment, films, legal affairs, music, peace and disarmament, poetry, and the United Nations. Um, and you know they've they've been a paper that in the past has been <laughs> fairly well respected uh, or not they're not a paper but they're they're like a I think a weekly magazine uh, they, f they feature a lot of the people that you would think um, are generally on the far left of the spectrum Eric Foner Noam Chomsky uh, Eric Foner is one of these um, you know he's he's a uh, historian, um, real trade unionist. So let's talk about Eric Foner for a second. This is uh, an intellectual and historian who once compared the fall of the Soviet Union to the secession of the South in the Civil War. Now, I don't know if he was making a complete moral equivalency, but 
I could pretty much say that the two are pretty different. Uh, on the one hand, you have an ethnic minority uh, in almost every case in the Soviet Union leaving because the Soviet Union uh, basically squelched all of their efforts to express themselves. And Foner was there as a guest historian while he made that statement. So this is somebody in the midst of the collapse of a totalitarian regime, basically grasping at straws to um, make it seem like that was a regressive uh, event. Uh, it's not a regressive event. The regressive event is the creation of a massive empire that is controlled by a party of people that concentrate all the power at the top, which is the Soviet Union. So basically that's the type of person, and I'm not saying he can't have his opinion, but that's the type of opinion that is common at a place like the <coughs> Real News. So back to their reporting. This is from last year, okay? Uh, June 30th of last year, almost a year ago, and they're, they're saying... Media exaggerations of apocalyptic Venezuela plays into regime change narrative. Well, nothing has gone... First of all, regime change would imply that the the rest of the world or so, some other foreign power is conspiring to change the government in Venezuela. If you look at the facts on the ground, the person that's most conspiring to bring down the government there is, is Maduro, the president of the government. The man is an incompetent buffoon. But... Um, these people will try as hard as they can to pull any reason out of their ass why this country is not falling apart and it is surviving. So I'm looking into something a year old, and, and let me make a couple observations here. We have the author of that article with us today, Gabriel Hetland. Hetland is joining us from Albany. New York. He is assistant professor of Latin American Caribbean. An intellectual from Albany, New York. And U.S. Latino Studies at the University of Albany, SUNY. Thank you so much for joining us, Gabriel. Thank you, Charmini. Great to be here. And he's also being joined by Rachel Boothroyd. She joins us from Bogota, Colombia. She's a free. So, a quick um, switch. Gabriel Hetland, one of the people featured, uh, is a Corbinite. He's an American supporting Jeremy Corbyn, the loony idiot that ran for Prime Minister of the UK earlier this month and lost. So that's who we're dealing with here. Uh, yeah, real unbiased reporting, the real news. She joins us from Bogota, Colombia. She's a freelance journalist and doctoral candidate in Latin American studies at the University of Liverpool, UK. She has lived in Venezuela for almost five years and currently works for VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Thanks for joining. Okay, this is a British academic working for VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Now, what does Venezuela Analysis, what type of stories do they run? I'll, I'll bring in a quick window. So you have here Venezuela's Maduro condemns helicopter attack on Supreme Court and the Justice Ministry. Official communique, helicopter attack is escalation in regime change campaign. Venezuela, soldier killed, three more burned alive. CNE releases list of approved candidates for elections to constituent assembly. Venezuelan protester dies in attack on airbase. OAS fails to pass anti-Venezuela resolution amid rumors of more U.S. sanctions. Um, here's, a, here's an opinion article. It says, is Venezuela's attorney general biased towards the opposition? Human Rights Watch thinks Brazil can help Venezuela with human rights. Um, then it has Venezuela, our program for the constituent assembly by Lucha de Clases. Lucha de Clases means class struggle in defense of Marxism. That's, that's a, I guess that's somebody's a pen name. It says, the calling of a national constituent assembly has been issued in the middle of one of the worst offensives of the counter-revolution and imperialism in the last 18 years. In this political situation, the convening of a constituent assembly 
has awoken important revolutionary aspirations among sections of the workers and people's vanguard who are ready to fight to elect deputies to the constituent assembly who come from the rank and file to defend a program of revolutionary demands. So this, this isn't, this, she's not bringing people that are really in touch with whatever is going on there. She's bringing mouthpieces of the Venezuelan um, uh, government. She, she's actually br broadcasting bald, unadulterated pro <coughs> propaganda of the Venezuelan state. And I'm not even kidding, okay? So I could, I, it's, it would be one thing if she were to state publicly, yes, these people are supporters of Maduro and the government, but she doesn't do that. No problem. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, so let me start with you, Gabriel. Now, you just spent a few weeks in Venezuela going around talking to numerous people on various sides of the discussion. Uh, and I should say people experiencing the, the crisis, especially the food crisis. Um, but um, what do you make of the headlines I just read out? And uh, what are people actually saying? What's the real story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the headlines that are coming from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all the different sources that you cited today are presenting a picture of a total apocalypse, a country that has completely fallen apart, in the words of the New York Times, that is already in a state of total collapse, where there's the image presented as a sort of generalized hunger, widespread looting, institutions that are falling apart. Um, and it is true that Venezuela is in the midst of a very severe crisis, which is marked by triple-digit inflation, um, widespread changes to food consumption patterns, mounting social and political discontent, um, and a host of other problems. But the mainstream media image that's been presented does not accord with reality, as I saw it for the approximately three and a half weeks I was in Venezuela. Um, the mainstream has consistently and possibly deliberately exaggerated what's going on in Venezuela to present this really, really horrendous situation um, which goes above and beyond what's happening. The situation is definitely a real crisis, but it's not apocalyptic the way that you've seen it in the mainstream media. Why deliberately? Um, well, I mean, I can't say that for sure, so I should be careful with that, but um, I, I think some of these folks should know better. I think they should be doing a little bit more careful research to really talk to everyone. When they find something really bad, you end up hearing the same story in outlet, outlet, after outlet, after outlet. So recently there's been stories about people, um, you know, running to trees and trying to grab mangoes off the trees. And I've heard from friends that that's appearing all over the place. Everybody's talking about these sort of mango stories. So you're seeing a repetition of these sort of apocalyptic narratives that's happening. I just think that the, um, you know, it's certainly true that there's um, a lot of difficulty happening in Venezuela. There is real suffering, and th this is something that the government hasn't been quick enough to acknowledge, hasn't been forthright enough about. But at the same time, the images that are presented in the media over and over and over again um, in this sort of repetition echo chamber um, just don't quite accord with the reality on the ground. They go a little too far in terms of the image that they're presenting. So th this is a guy. He's he's basically um, claiming that they're they're just over, they're just blowing this all out of proportions. I mean, starvation, um, lack of uh, of, of uh, housing, rampant crime and murder. Though that's not the sign of an apocalypse. That's that's just a gross exaggeration. So let's see if we can find something more recent as far as how the real news covers Venezuela. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Violent protests between opposition demonstrators and police forces in Venezuela have been going on for over two months now, with an average of almost one dead per day. Most of the international press portrays the death as being the result of police state repression. However, a detailed breakdown from the Attorney General's office, which has recently been increasingly at odds with the government of President Maduro, shows that of the 73 people 
that died. 11 were the responsibility of state security forces. 21 of them has been attributed to the opposition, 13 due to looting, and two due to government civilian protests, and 26 are still under investigation. One of the victims of the protests was Orlando Figuera, who was burned alive last month when opposition demonstrators accused him of being a thief or a chavista. He died from his wounds last Monday. This is what his mother had to say. Si es así, ¿por qué Julio Borges lo permite y Enrique Capriles lo permite? Entonces, ¿a quién yo voy a culpar? So, you know, I'm not going to, like, say whether or not uh, burning a man alive is a justifiable course of action. Uh, I'm not in Venezuela, so taking a page from the left's way of explaining crisis overseas, I, I can't put my shoe, my hand, my, my, I can't put myself in their shoes. So I don't know whether this is good or bad, right? And notice, notice the the um, the tone here. Okay, they're they're first of all they they used a statistic compiled by the government attorney general over the footage of water cannons and military police chasing protesters down the streets. Uh, this is the diametric opposite of everything they said during Ferguson and every other crisis and riot that we've had here. Uh, and this was just two weeks ago. So let's see a little more. We're not going to watch the whole video just like the other one, but you'll get the gist of it. And by the way, the logo over here is Telesur, which is a Venezuela government-owned propaganda media arm. Uh, in English. It's owned by the government, okay? It literally is owned by the government. So who are they kidding? Obviously, his mother considers this the responsibility of the leadership of the opposition. Joining us to discuss the latest developments in Venezuela is Abby Martin. Abby is the host of the Telesu English documentary program, Empire Files, that Abby and Mike Prinzer independently produce, and they recently returned from the... From a so how can you independently produce something when you're employed by Telesur which is an organ of the Venezuelan state media. Trip to Venezuela, and they were caught up in the midst of opposition demonstrations. Thank you for joining me, Abby. Thanks so much, Charmini. It's great to be on. So, Abby, um, you went to Venezuela to, you know, I spoke to you before you left, uh, and you were going there on an inquiry to figure out what was going on. You found yourself in the midst of opposition demonstrations. Uh, describe how you got there, why you were there, and what happened. Sure. Uh, my partner, Mike Preisner, and I wanted to go to Venezuela, of course, you know, with a country that's been under the, in the crosshairs of the U.S. empire for uh, the last decade plus, obviously, since the Bolivarian Revolution. It's even been... Real unbiased language there in the crosshairs of the empire. Uh, some of the um, <coughs> so, some of the past projects of Abby Martin include 99% the Occupy Wall Street collaborative film, and she's worked for RT America, which, which you know, I'll say this. I accept that RT America is, you know, I'll watch it or whatever. I do take everything they say with a little grain of salt, they are still owned by the Russian government. So this isn't somebody who's an independent journalist. This is somebody who's uh, worked for state media organs before and is still doing it today. Deemed the greatest threat to the Western Hemisphere, of course, amidst all of these threats, um, and, of course, regime change calls from, from Trump himself and, and, of course, this bill from Mark Rubio uh, offering to give $10 million to the opposition, which would turn into um, exponentially more on the black market there. Um, of course, we wanted to go and check out what was going on. Um, we actually had planned the trip before all the unrest popped off, so we were kind of scared. Uh, I, I had seen all this footage of of the crackdowns, what I thought was really harsh repression based on the footage and news that I was seeing from here. So I was going with a completely open mind 
Um, I was going there um, as an independent, fiercely independent investigative journalist with the show, as you said, produced completely independently from Telesor to tell exactly the reality that I was seeing. And I even told um, Telesor management that I was going to report exactly what the truth uh, was uh, that I uncovered. So when we went there, um, I was very surprised to see that the reality was uh, vastly different than what we were being told, Charmini. I mean, yes, I, you hear all these um, horrific stories, right, from on the ground um, amidst these protests. Uh, you keep hearing 60 dead. Um, Maduro kills 60 protesters, you know, Maduro's forces. And what you realize when you get there is uh, the country is pretty much split in two. It's heavily uh, uh, divided uh, between Chavistas and the opposition. And um, of course, amidst such economic, uh, such a horrible economic crisis, people are going to have really strong opinions. But there are certainly huge marches on the ground um, on both sides, tens of thousands of people marching for the government, for the opposition. And these are peaceful marches, uh, a jubilant atmosphere. Um, things are very uh, calm. Um, and then... That's an interesting statement, given that opposition uh, protesters have recently begun fighting at an air base and, and hijacking a helicopter and, 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 you know, the government arrested the entire National Assembly. So I don't know who she's, she thinks she's fooling. I think she's, re, you know, it's a, to a certain degree, I think she's pretending that she's reporting the truth and that there is a huge opposition. But uh, if you look at these images, the majority of them are of pro-government people. What you realize is when you see these violent statistics and, and casualties and the death toll that's rising and the harsh, quote unquote, repression from government forces, it's not happening at these marches. It's happening at something called guarimbas. It's a sustained um, blockade that a small contingent of protesters create um, to provoke a response from government officials. So we actually. You mean like Ferguson? Actually followed one of these guarimbas one night. Um, we were almost attacked just simply for being there. Um, we got accosted by a hyped up group of protesters who were saying, what, where are you, who are you with? Who are you with? It, demanding to see our press credentials. And I was scared for my life, knowing that if we admitted that we were from Telesur, we could have gotten lynched, um, burned alive, um, beaten to death. Yes, because you are from state owned media and they know it. How dumb do you think people are? Uh, by the mobs that you see happening all too often. So we, of course, said that we were independent journalists, that we were from America, and then they immediately said, okay, great, we can use you essentially for propaganda. They said, do not film anything we do, um, just film what the government does to us, Germany. So we saw that night um, what these people do on the quote-unquote front lines of these protests. I mean, they, they pulled out giant... Um, 16-wheeler uh, trucks. They pulled people out of the trucks, moved the trucks onto the highway to block entrances and exits. They were pulling huge uh, piles of trash and burning them, pouring gasoline on the front entrances and exits of... Kind of like the West Bank, where you also report about Palestinian quote-unquote resistance. These highway overpasses and erupting in flames. And so trucks were and, and cars were trying to frantically get out of the way. And this is how a lot of people have died. Um, an, uh, this death toll that you see being kind of parroted, uh, regurgitated mindlessly by MSM um, does not account for the actual breakdown that you mentioned in the intro, which is the vast majority has been caused by either indirect or direct violence by the opposition. In what form did you see these threats uh, launched against you about lynching, about uh, attacking you? Is that a Twitter uh, uh, attacks or did you actually hear it on the ground? Well, uh, yeah, good, good question, Charmini. This has been translated actually into real life actions now. It started off on Twitter um, and a lot of people can say, oh, just turn off your Twitter. That's not, it's not as easy as that. Um, when you have hundreds of death threats coming in, you have to take it seriously, especially when these people do act on it there. And there are telesur journalists risking their lives to still be on the ground um, at these protests and now have a target on their back. Um, it started off on Twitter, of course, Instagram, Facebook, which are all manageable um, until it translates into real life. And, and this one woman, Angie Perez, a quote unquote Emmy award winning journalist from Miami, um, was uh, tweeting out coordinates where Mike was going to be speaking in L.A. when we got back. And so, so if you looked at the image, let me rewind. 
you have an image of them posing in front of a photo of Chavez with Chavez's vice president, Diosdado Cabello. He's, he's in the, if you see my cursor there. These people are Venezuelan government apologists, and yet they're being used as, uh, quote unquote, and this is worse than the Iraq war reporting when, um, uh, you know, the Iraq war propaganda when they would put that guy on Baghdad Bob and he would pretend that, you know, Iraq was actually winning and that they were taking territory and whatever. This is war. This is worse because it's more believable for the, you know, the dumb viewer of whatever, uh, you know, the real news dot com. Venezuela is falling apart and you have the real news trying to use Venezuelan government uh, propagandists as quote unquote independent journalists. This is just plain madness. Okay, who who really believes this garbage? So, you know, I'm going to cut it off here. How much more of this can you get? Um, it says here, uh, Angie Perez. Uh, let's look her up for a second. Okay, this is Angie Perez, who is a, she, I think she is an Emmy Award winning journalist who denounced them as, uh, you know, propaganda journalists. This is her uh, footage that she's posted on her Twitter timeline for the assault on Aragua base. What the hell is going on? If the real news saw this happening in America, they would be absolutely fine with it. They, they, they wouldn't even bat an eye at, um, you know, talking about how people are uh, fighting against the government, the repressive government. Um, she, she did win an Emmy, I think, at Telemundo. Um, so, look, go... Go um, tell me that, tell us, sir, the government organ media is the more, um, you know, the more dependable news source on a topic where we're talking about people protesting and fighting against the government. Nobody's going to believe that. This is ridiculous. This is, the real news network is fake news. And <coughs> if they're going to, here, let, let me stop the distraction again. We're back to Abby Martin and her, her uh, husband, Michael Prisoner. If they're going to pretend that they're independent journalists, okay, and they're, you know, I'm going to keep the footage rolling in the meantime, you know, with the mute on, they, these people are completely fake. They're broadcasting from some location in Venezuela, Okay, there's no reason to believe that uh, anything that they're saying is, is uh, I mean, the, the, again, it says, this person is saying correctly, Abby Martin and Michael Prisoner, uh, American reporters, reporters for Telesor TV are infiltrating opposition protests in order to collect intelligence for He and Abe, the... Venezuelan secret police that that's that's the way people are perceiving them because that's what they are doing that they, this isn't a question of whether they are um, being censored or whatever or the, the opposition is targeting them that <coughs> everybody knows that Telesur everybody in Venezuela at least knows that Telesur is the Venezuelan government's uh, mouthpiece so the real news should learn how to do either do real journalism or, you know, be more honest about how they're just pushing an agenda. They're protecting their buddies, the Venezuelan government, and, and they do, they wouldn't do it for our government. They wouldn't do it for any government that they oppose, you know, wh whether it's uh, Russia or Israel or, or um, the government of uh, Qatar, let's say they, they are basically giving cover for a, a repressive regime, and that's all there is to it.
So that's it. This is Bold Like a Leopard. I'm going to watch the rest of this myself. I'll post all the links, and you can judge for yourself. Is the real news real or fake?